up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Nerd Gen Report. I'm your host, Pablo. Joining me, as always, is Mr. Brian Schultz. We have a lot to discuss today. We have the finale of WandaVision that we would like to discuss. Um, that's going to be fun. We have also the weekly Zack Snyder news. Um, we have uh, also a little bit more insight in, as to what the Eternal is going to look like, uh, uh, according to Koi Zhao. Then we get uh, a little bit of a sneak peek as to um, what Shang-Chi's uh, costume is going to look like, Marvel's best kept secret. And then we'll get into uh, a little bit of a discussion on what Bob Chapek, uh, in my eye, seems to feel as we've reached a point of no return. Brian, how are you? I'm good. Uh, a bit of a busy week, but first Marvel show is in the books and countdown is on to the second one and the Snyder Cut and really the sort of this peak late March and early April that we've got going on. So, yeah. so very exciting and a, and, a, and a lot to talk about. I think, you know, some pros and some cons actually from the way things wrap. So I think we could do a deep dive here, but, but uh, nice to kind of have that first show wrap so we can kind of talk about it in its totality. You know what I was thinking about before um, I started thinking about the show is to, I started thinking about our top, uh, for, the, the show that we did where we ranked Disney's, uh, Disney Plus shows, Marvel Disney Plus shows. And I had WandaVision as number one. You had WandaVision as number three. I guess as time goes on, I guess when all is said and done, we'll sort of go back and re- and redo that and see if, how close we were mm -hmm. uh, as far as our cool. ranking. So, oh, before we get into it, we would like to ask everyone, please to support the channel by hitting that like button, hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell, share it with your friends. It really does help uh, support the, the channel. So WandaVision. It was funny to me to read uh, how the director or I guess the showrunner or somebody involved with the WandaVision uh, show said that they were going to, they were a little bit uh, nervous as to the fans being possibly disappointed uh, because of how it ended. And I get it because, you know, you get the, you start thinking about back to Game of Thrones and how that went down. And it was all, it was all due a lot. It had a lot to do with uh, fans' expectations and their fan theories and all that other stuff that didn't come true and, and the lackluster it, way it ended for me the way wandavision ended was fine was was fine i i i still think that this was a, a a great show despite not getting um the theories of mephisto uh and, and other theories that that fans were throwing out there i still i still think that mephisto is still in play uh just not in hell so um you tell me uh brian what did you think of wandavision as the series as a whole and this and this finale um yeah there's kind of two different vantage points here i think in a vacuum as we've always said the floor with marvel is extremely high and i felt like that was honored again here it was they checked their boxes you know i watched it twice the, the day it came out there there's very little to kind of say is outright bad so it's hard to get on them mm -hmm. i do think it was underwhelming relative to some of the highs that this show reached and i think in particular coming off of episode eight which i thought was a real high point not just for the show but for the mcu like a different style of episode really dramatic didn't have the act I don't think it paid that off. I got to be honest. Like, I think it was a step down from that. And so I put this show, at least for the time being, we'll see the other ones coming into the category of good, but not transcendent. And, and I think that's, it just felt to me, like, there's highs and lows here, mm -hmm. but in the end, it felt pretty safe for a show that had really not played it safe at a lot of points. It felt very formulaic Marvel, right? We got to sort of the, the classic combat, uh, we introduced a new MacGuffin. Um, we didn't 
a lot of you know and i don't think the cast really helped themselves by with some of the hype that they fed into like this was not an example where they probably set the director knew it they probably set themselves up for that disappointment mm -hmm. um and i think there's a couple other moments i'm sure we'll get into but so overall it felt more like classic marvel that we've seen and i think this show had at least gotten us to a point where it felt like they could push the envelope on that I didn't feel like they pushed it enough. That being said, as I said, it was enjoyable. It was very rewatchable, actually, on the yes, second yes, time. Yeah. Uh, and it probably won't be the last time that I watch this episode because certainly when Doc Strange 2 comes out, I'll probably come back and revisit this. So a very enjoyable 45 minutes, but not an unforgettable 45 minutes is what I would say. Yeah. Uh, I liked it uh, possibly a little bit more than you did. I think definitely it had its high notes with the reveal of... Uh, Scarlet Witch and her her costume. Her costume was dope. Great. Her costume was One of my dope. high points. Yes, I texted yes. the, that was the one thing I texted <laughs> you. I was like, she looked good. The costume yeah, was yeah, really yeah. Nice. They, they really pulled that off. Yeah. Um, and I think that's going to be sort of a, a mainstay as to how some of these new characters and how they originally look in the comics, how they're going to look in live action, right? Especially, I think the big one is everybody waiting for that Wolverine costume. But anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, this one uh, is a hokey one in the comics, right? This is a yeah. tough translation, so they did yeah. a nice job yes. of modernizing it while yes. keeping some of the classic elements. Yes, um, I enjoyed the fight scene between Agatha and and uh, and Scarlet Witch. I also enjoyed the the, the fight scene between Vision and uh, the Vision. Uh, so we sort of don't know where uh, the White Vision certainly is going to come up again in the near future, perhaps in Doctor Strange 2 or in later uh, storylines where it involves um, uh, the Scarlet Witch. Um, the one thing I didn't like was Darcy. Darcy's role in this is <laughs> like, she, you, if you blink, you miss her, <laughs> you know? And they gave her, they, they sort of uh, 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 um, gave her the shaft on that, on that episode. It was just, very uh underwhelming for her character who's been a mainstay throughout the show um and enjoy and quite enjoyable um one of the things that stood out for me at the end the the last cutscene it reminded me of the end of incredible hulk Oh, you mean like Dazed Incident Zero, where he's sitting in the... Yes. Yeah. It, it's sort of the same. It was like almost shot for shot. Pretty, pretty nice. Much. Yes, yeah. yes. It was pr pretty much shot for shot. A place where they, they, they're they secluded, no one's around, and they're learning to accept who they are and uh, um, them controlling their, their, their powers. Uh, one of the things I also noticed with um, the Scarlet Witch, like, it's really hard to tell if she, she's not a good guy. No, I don't she's think not, she's not a good guy. Think about what she did. She held captive a town, right? Basically hostage for however long it, it, it was. And she left unscathed. She walked among them. There's uh, law enforcement right there. They didn't even approach her and she bounces. That's how scared everybody is of her. That's what I took out of that. What did you think? Yeah, I think a lot, I think along the lines of where she's headed, they didn't go quite as dark as maybe I thought they might based on the comics, but I think this ambiguity over what she's going to be next is still there and to your point you know she talked big about setting things right we didn't really see that kind of quit on the like she <laughs> erased the hex but all the people and you know the, i thought the scene where she's with the mom you know saying like my kids locked in the room and i can't be with, like you know she went to pretty extreme lengths to disrupt their lives to make this happen so no yeah, I certainly think, let's put it this way, if she was to pop up, let's say, like, it, it, you know, if she was to pop up and rescue somebody next week, I think, you know, J. Jonah Jameson would probably be, you know, launching more negative press at her than at Spider-Man, given yeah. what just happened, just from a PR perspective. So, yeah, I think that part is is definitely 
TBD. I think the way she leaves and the last scene, I think she's headed to a darker place before a lighter one. You know, I will get it. We'll get into this, 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 the breakdown of that. But I, I think that, you know, her reading the dark hold and hearing what clearly seems to be another earth, right? A multiverse reference. That's not going to lead to anywhere good for her in, yeah. the, in the immediate term. I don't think she's ready for that. So I definitely think we're, and I also think with white vision, which I have issues with, but white vision being set up as basically true vision with his memory intact, he's now out there operating as almost like this voice of reason to maybe make her, bring her back to reality that I, I would bet she's going to lose uh, in, in, in Doc Strange 2 based upon what we're seeing. So yeah, no, I agree with you. I mean, I think definitely think like we have not seen the full consequences of this show and what happened to her yet. And I'm guessing Doc Strange will will bring that forward for us in a pretty meaningful way. You think Agatha shows up in Doctor Strange 2 or Yeah, 100 percent In Doctor Strange 2? Do you yeah, think there's 100%. there's room for her that? I mean, because the relationship in the comics between her and Agatha has been sort of a mentor mentee sort of situation, right? Um I don't know, but it's, it, there could be possible room for a season two for this. Um, a, a exploring that, because uh, I don't, I don't see Doctor Strange really showing her how to use her powers, right? But I, but see, I think the avenue is open for that, and I think that had they, given we know they're not planning season two, there are no active plans for season two. Okay. The way this show played out, had Scarlet Witch destroyed Agatha in this episode or done something to her in a more permanent way, yeah, yeah. I don't think we would have thought of her any less than we do, if that makes sense. I think we would have kind of moved on from that. So the fact that they did what they did and kind of gave her her own personal hex in Westview, to me, is not an accident. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. what I would say to you is, given that Agatha warned her a, there's a whole chapter about you in this book. And B, you're not ready for it, right? Her keeps saying, you don't know what you have unleashed. You don't know what you've unleashed. All of that to me points to, she's gonna find out what she unleashed in Doctor Strange 2, and it's gonna be too much for her to handle. Yeah. And so she's gonna have to come back to the source, which is Agatha in some ways to kind of get to the bottom of it, which also leaves the room for Mephisto, Thon, whoever you want to be on the other end of the dark hole, I think is gonna be there and she's going to probably need Agatha in some perverse way to help her in, in Doctor. So I think all of that is actually open and it kind of makes some sense to me that they, I was just a little disappointed that, you know, as I said, I thought they could have even aligned her more with Agatha in this show had they really yeah. wanted to. And I was wondering yeah. if they were going to be that bold and they didn't quite get there. So yeah. we'll see if it happens to Doctor Strange too. Do you think uh, the dark hole unleashes all the things that Blade will be involved in? Uh, and possible other uh, anomalies like werewolf, vampires, all this other stuff that, that, cause it seems to point towards that because from based on what I read, I didn't read a whole bunch, but based on what I read, it, uh, you know, it has all those, uh, I guess, dimensions of bringing all these uh, beings into that world and then you know having to be having to have a counterpart like blade and other uh heroes having to fight the that 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 situation i admit i i mean the blade angle never even crossed my mind i had real issues with the dark hole being used in this episode i felt like it wasn't earned um this is clearly an important new MacGuffin that will carry forward into doc yeah. strange 2 and, and to your point maybe even other stories but given that we had literally seen one shot of it yeah, yeah. prior to this episode, for her to then be holding it, referring to it, and then ultimately becomes this object of pursuit for Wanda that she then takes to the end, that felt a little forced to me. That, yeah. that, again, that felt a little bit like Marvel putting the formula back into this show where they kind of hadn't really used it. And it felt like if they wanted that, then there probably would have been room in episodes five through eight to leverage the dark hold maybe a little more explicitly than they did. So I gotta be honest, that was on one of my, that was one of my critiques that the book was so prominent. I think if, they, I think I would have preferred they leave it as a stinger, like something that 
just jumped into the next thing mm -hmm. or have it be a bigger part of the whole series. So to go the way they did felt kind of in the middle and left me a little bit unsatisfied. But maybe I'll feel different after Doc Strange 2. How did you feel about um, Pietro? Cheated a little bit. Again, th so this falls in the category of like, I just don't think the cast helped themselves with the talk around this, yeah. you know? I, and look, I mean, maybe there's something else to this that it has, you know, you never know. Marvel always loves to retcon and, you know, have ulterior motives and, and what have yeah. you. But yeah, mm -hmm. I felt a little disappointed that this kind of felt like a dead end, given he was, like, he, if it was one scene in a dead end, I wouldn't care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But given he had a role in this show, for him to turn out to be an actor who had basically <laughs> been corrupted, yeah, felt a little. But yeah, yeah, and then and then the the cheesy uh, joke with his name being Ralph Boner, and and I, if I'm James Gunn, I'm looking at Disney weird. I'm like, really, Disney Boner? <laughs> it, it almost made me. Pref I was thinking it almost made me wish that they, if that was the case. If they were going to do the true Pietro and not have it go anywhere, yeah. then I kind of almost wish they had brought Aaron Taylor Johnson back and not have teased the X-Men exactly. universe at all. Exactly. That would have been more personal to Wanda, and I wouldn't have felt bitter that it didn't go anywhere because I felt like, all right, we got our closure with with this version of Quicksilver in the MCU. So actually, I yeah, as I said, it didn't didn't totally sit well with me in the end. Yeah, there was just so much talk about, oh, is this the Fox? The, the Fox um, Quicksilver, are they doing that multiverse thing? There was a lot of talk of that. And for that to be just completely like, no, this is not it. This is not it. And, and, you know, it's just obviously a lot of waste of time for us to think about all that stuff when they were just going to go with this. But still, I wasn't um, so disappointed in the in the show that that, um, you know, like there's some there's a lot of people who are disappointed, really, that that it ended this way and i thought i although there was some things that like you wish you would have came to fruition based on some of the theories that we talked about that made sense um that are possibly still in play um for those little things like we focused a lot on who is the messenger guy right who who is who is pietro we i don't even think we got a conclusion or or, or an explanation as who was the guy that that the, the honeycomb dude uh you know that was just a lot just of people yeah yeah which was fine but you know just like oh okay this is it all all right whatever so you move on sort of thing so two other um two other critiques and then i did want to shift to high points because there were some high points so what did you think of White Vision? I thought he was a little underutilized in this. I was hoping a little bit more for the emotionless angle to be played as opposed to he shows up, immediately tries to crush her skull, and then we're right into the fight. And it was almost like the Terminator. He wasn't yeah. really like a real character. I thought his peak to me was, but we won't talk. The ship of Theseus scene is one of my three favorite scenes in this episode. Yeah, I think yeah, it's yeah. awesome. But like, yeah, yeah his interaction with Wanda I thought was too short. I was hoping for more of that because that was critical in the comics. It, it kind of just turned into like a save the day moment for Paul, for good yeah. vision. I didn't quite, I didn't mind it too much because I know this is going to be something that we'll, we'll revisit uh, later on. Um, there wasn't, I don't think this just wasn't enough time to really explore that uh, relationship or that thought of who is this vision and what sort of relationship I'm going to have, what, what sort of communication will I have with this vision? This was just this one instance he was sent in to do a job. And before he did what he did, vision came in and, you know, sort of stopped that from happening. And then we move on from there. My but, second the, one, but the fact that she ready. didn't like the fact that she didn't say anything afterwards. Yeah. There was nothing like no. No, not even a thought about it, which was weird. Yeah, it felt, that's what I'm saying, it felt a little incomplete and abbreviated um, yeah. to me from that angle. It, whereas it felt like vision on vision felt a little more realized, even in one episode, they progressed that forward. So that was what, the other one, I just had a random question for you. Do you like, or did you like, do you like the flying effects in this? I didn't, I didn't mind it. About it. 
You didn't, I didn't mind, mind it? it? Nah, I didn't mind oh. it at all. It looked good to me. It's weird. So I didn't mind the wand and Agatha because they're more magic floating. Yeah. So that one was fine. I gotta be honest, there's something about the vision on vision that just looked and felt a little bit off to me. Like the physics felt a little bit off just watching it. And I gotta be honest, it, it I think I think Zack Snyder got this one a little bit better in Superman's oh, Eye. Yeah. There's something about that. This one just felt a little more video gamey, the way they were kind of zipping around and zooming around. Whereas I felt like when Superman and Zob were going at it, there was this sense of you were flying along with them and there was an uneven realism to that. I don't know. Right. It, just, it was one of those like subtle, like as I was watching it twice, I was like, I don't know. There's something a little bit just off. And I don't know quite how to describe it other than that. I hope because it was brighter the the town there wasn't that much to, i don't know it looked fine to me the flying and the fighting when they were phasing in and phasing out i think they did a lot of that stuff really well um again they didn't go overboard with it and uh yeah it seemed fine to me i didn't have any yeah. bad feelings towards how it looked okay um well, so what were, so for me, high points, I would say the top three things where I mentioned, I mentioned the ship that Theseus seen. I absolutely love that. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's everything I like about the Vision character. He's always curious. Yes. And in the end, they can't get away from that. And I like that essence of the character. So very cool. I love that exchange. One and Vision saying goodbye. I mean, I think that's a scene that could go so cheesy and so wrong. Uh, and, and the two of them pull it off and it did have weight to it. And, and I, and there was some really good writing in the show between the two of them, the whole, yeah, I think yeah, a lot yeah. of people fixed it on the, what is grief, if not love persevering. But I thought even in this where it's like, we've said goodbye before. So now we'll say hello. Yeah. They did a really nice job. I really yeah. like that exit for them. And then the stingers, Marvel is always the master of stingers and both the mid credit and the end credit ones got me pumped for what's coming down. What did you think of that mid credit scene? Oh, I, I mean, it. we. I mean, we talked about somebody possibly being a scroll. We we and, were thinking some, <laughs> one other person was a scroll, but somebody which they popped still up. Could be. Yes, which they yes, still true, could. true, 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 true. Which they still could be. But I no, I thought it was. I thought it was perfect. I thought it was a good decision to sideline Monica Rambo for the finale for this. I think if they had brought her in with her superpowers in a big way, it would have detracted from the main conflict. So yeah. they let her show off a little bit of the phasing. Um, and then gave her that moment at the end where I think this show actually, they sold it as a Doc Strange 2 prep, but I feel like this show really prepped Captain Marvel 2 in as just well. as meaningful a way. And yeah. then they didn't hype that at all. Yeah. But I think they've taken a big step forward to getting me excited for that. And so, yeah, 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 yeah. look, if we're headed to space and find out what Nick Fury or, or Ben Talos are doing up there, or Ben Mendelsohn are doing up there. Yeah. Awesome. So, no, I think it was actually neat to see an actual scroll show up you know in in, in the end of this so big, i'm big looking i'm looking forward to seeing what nick fury has to say about what happened there because you know he's gonna know he that's the only reason he wants to see her because he knows that monica rambeau has powers or has some abilities right and is probably you know he's watching this from all the way up there getting intel so it's going to be interesting to see what he has uh to to say in reference to that Situation. Well, there's also the name drop from Jimmy Woo of Cliff. I don't know if you followed that. So Cliff in the comics, there's a Cliff, and I forget his last name, who's like a Nick Fury lieutenant. Like, they're very close. And so that people are wondering, was that a random name? Because he he's the one who kind of sends in the, the FBI, you know, at the end. We don't ever see him. Mm -hmm, but the mm -hmm. fact that he uses that name had people wondering whether that's another scroll version or whether it's another comic. So anyway, yeah, I think there's... To your point, I think we've yet to hear from the X Shield. I don't know what to call them at this point. Angle, yeah. angle on this. So, one of the things that I, I, I was left thinking about was so that uh, super speed that Ralph had or Pietro had. I I found it hard to sort of believe that he could that even. Her giving her that, giving him that, 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 whatever, that choker or whatever, giving him that ability to run fast mm -hmm. was weird for me to see, like physically, even magic, you know, it, it was just weird to see that that was what's giving him his ability to, with yeah. the super speed, yeah. that little thing. He's a regular dude. 
Right. No one else had any issue. I mean, obviously, no one was given that 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 opening of having any sort of power, but he was, and it was all based off of that necklace or that 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 spell that she put on that necklace that he gave him. So I found that kind of weird. Oh, uh, all right. Last thing, or what did you think about? I mean, they, I mean, they packed a lot into about those last five seconds. You know, they they actually put the Doc Strange score like his theme plays, you hear the kids. So, you know, I think that tells you the kids are real, at least somewhere they exist. And it's still referencing possibly that connection to Mephisto. And I was just about to say, like, I think all theories are still on the table for Mephisto and Thon or whatever you want to use for that third player, which we didn't get in the show, but nothing was closed off. Yeah, so I, I thought it was I thought it was really well done. Again, it reminded me of that last scene in uh, Incredible Hulk. Uh, some people are speculating that that area, that place that she's in, is uh, some place in Sokovia where the book was written or something like that. And she sure. goes to, and she goes to that place to I guess to study up on what she is capable of doing or what she wants to do or whatever, but. It certainly reminded me as soon as I saw her reading the book, Doctor Strange, automatically. Right? I would. That was a. That was one of the uh, things that was a bit disappointing too. That we everybody believed that at least we were gonna get some um, cameo from Doctor Strange, and we didn't. Um, Where would he have fit, by the way? With the way they wrote this show, that's the only thing I struggled with in retrospect. Was with this script, where would you have inserted him? I think I wouldn't insert him in that space. It would have to be him getting A, some intel, B, getting some sort of uh, some sort of feeling of whatever, you know? Uh, there's this other being that has these sort of powers that he knows about some connection to the book whether it was in the library or some some talk of it um something that had no connection um to what had happened in westview but more so of just a a talk uh let's say wong talking about somebody's using the dark (laughs) hold or you know something that would have sort of um put it into that doctor strange to sort of situation, but they did it the way they did it. And it was fine for me, you know, let, let's see how they put it together, I guess, in the next film. So I think in truth, I think if he had been anywhere other than the last stinger, it, he wouldn't really have. Oh yeah. Bit. I think, yeah. I think you could have, you could have had some inference or connection with her reading the dark hold, hearing some of that audio. And if you wanted to cut to him somewhere sitting in the sanctum, and like his eyes go like that could have worked yes but i don't think he if you put him in the fight i don't think it oh, would no. have helped the show no 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 no, no. so there really wasn't anything yeah really to do. yeah i mean but that was what i was expecting that yeah. sort of cutscene where dr strain gets some sort of feeling or some sort of awakening as to this 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 force is awakened and he has to sort some sort of um fix it or find out who is using this this power that sort of thing but they didn't go that route and le- again I'm, I'm interested in seeing how WandaVision and Doctor Strange connect in the in Doctor Strange so that's going to be uh, very interesting to me how they pull that off this will be a hard question to answer without seeing Doctor Strange 2 do you want another season of this show I wouldn't mind if they did, but if they didn't, I would be fine as well. I'm in the same camp. Yeah. Because I don't think you can do the shtick they did this time again. And that leads me to, if it's more conventional Marvel, is this the best show for that? I don't know. And and so I'm kind of with you. Like, there's enough good here and enough highs to where if they wanted to take another crack at it in a couple years or next year, I would watch it, but in, I'm not begging for it. 
So this would be the only reason why season two would make sense for me. And it would be her trying to figure out where this other vision is. Uh, I guess a search for vision or whatever the case may be. Because that can't be resolved in a movie, I think. Hmm. I, I don't think it'll be can be resolved in Doctor Strange too. There's too many other things going on. The multiverse of madness is is huge. I don't think we have time to uh, entertain that relationship if there is one with that vision. I think possibly a season two could lend itself to that situation. Good call. I say, yeah. if they, I think you're right. I think if they really wanted to do a personal character arc with bringing the two of them back together, more suitable to a series than a film. That's a, that's a great call. That's a great call. I, I like that idea. Yeah. Uh, the other Doc Strange 2 references were all very subtle. They were to Sam Raimi, right? So you had the Oz the Great and Powerful on the movie board. Not a great movie, by the yeah. way, but they didn't even nod to him. And then they even had, they carried the Oz met metaphor through when the car hits Agatha and you see the shoes on it. That's basically a yeah, modern yeah, yeah, yeah. of the original Wizard of Oz, the house yeah. falling on the, on the witch. So there were definitely a couple. I will say the one thing I liked about the show, and they did it again here, was where, where Agatha says, you are stronger than the Sorcerer Supreme. Yes. I like this world where they are telling us, you know, she's a 10, he's an eight. Like, yeah, yeah. I like this. I just, <laughs> yeah, that yeah. part of Marvel, I'm, I'm down with. We know oh, who's yeah. stronger and who's I, weaker. Exactly, exactly. And, and then to see them go up against that eight going up against a 10 to, to yep. really find out if that is the case, right? Which that has to that. happen, I think, in Doc yeah. Strange too. I'm guessing he's going to confront her at some point. They yeah. will go at her at some yeah. point. So. That will definitely happen. And it's going to be very... Uh, everybody's going to keep their eyes glued to that scene when that happens to see how powerful she is and uh, whether he's impressed by her abilities, right? Because uh, he's arrogant. He's a social supreme. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, nothing is really going to impress him. So if she can go toe to toe and do stuff that he's like, yo, how this is happening, you know, that'll be interesting to see. Let us know what you think in the comment section below about uh, the WandaVision finale. Were you happy about it? Was this a Game of Thrones uh, revisit for you guys? Or was this a, a decent uh, ending for the show. I think I still think um, episode eight was perhaps one of the best. Yeah. No action, just a lot of uh, history and uh, just talking things and uh, talking things out or whatever. It, it was just a great episode. It gave us a lot of uh, intel on the overall universe. I think that that episode. But again, uh, let us know in the comment section what you thought about the finale. Now. Zack Snyder, Justice League. We got a reveal of the parts to this four hour spectacle. And we heard some voices in, one, in some of the trailers. They've been, they've been doing trailers for each of the characters now. Yep. All of which look great, by the way, as always. Yeah. yeah. That does a nice job. So we got um, six parts. Part one is Don't Count on It, Batman. Part two is The Age of Heroes. Part three, Beloved Mother, Beloved Son. Part four is Change Machine. Part five is All the King's Horses. Part six is Something Darker. Now we can all look at those uh, parts and sort of um, kind of decipher what uh, what's going to happen in those, those parts. Um... I don't know what to think about this because we can, we, I mean, we, we haven't seen the movie, but we have. <laughs> We've seen about um, half of it. it yes. Like. Yes. That's what latest reports would indicate. Yes. Um, so what do you think, Brian? So these or, two, I'm sorry. We've seen a quarter of it. We've seen okay. an hour of the four. Sorry, okay. Half of the theatrical release is in reportedly in this, in some form. Okay, 25%. so so there's gonna be a lot of scenes that we haven't seen. I'm looking forward to seeing that cyborg storyline. Mm -hmm. I think is going to be the best part of the film. Nothing that Ezra Miller is in is gonna be good. I think 
Um, but Cyborg is what I'm looking forward to seeing because there was a lot of uh, of the story that was cut out. And um, based on the some of the scenes that I've seen for Cyborg, uh, I think uh, he's going to be the standout. He's going for me. He's going to be the MVP. Yeah, I was going to say, for our Snyder Cut Oscars, he's the betting favorite for our yeah. version of Best Actor. We'll yes, see. So, yes, right, yeah. Yes. Um, Brian, <clears throat> there was, in, in the Batman trailer, you hear Martian Manhunter. You hear him say, I have a stake in this world, and now I must fight for it, something like that. We've said it over and over again. <laughs> You're gonna read this out. <laughs> I have to because it's like now, now you have a stake. Now you have a stake. If I'm Superman, I would ask him the question with the eyes red and everything, ready to burn him up. Like, yo, where were you when the planet was going to S H I T? <laughs> where were you, my friend? Now you have a stake. Are you kidding me? I needed you. And you were nowhere to be found. Granted, I'm looking forward to seeing what Manhunt, Martian Manhunter is going to look like, but I doubt he'll have a huge role in this. Uh, what do you What do you think about this? Yeah, look, I mean, <laughs> we've talked about it. They got their work cut out for them on this one. You know, I think we know where he was. That's the problem. The problem is, it's, the problem is like, unless you're somehow going to be able to present Martian Manhunter and Harry Lennox's General Swanwick character is not the same. So you can say Harry Lennox is playing both, but General Swanwick is not Martian Manhunter. And we know where he was. Mm -hmm. And that's a big part of the problem. Because then to your point, I'm Superman. I'm like, you ordered the hit. You <laughs> ordered the straight. You told them people to open fire on me. Why yeah. didn't you tell them to just fire on them? Yeah, right. Yeah. So you have all sorts of continuity issues. And then even in the second movie where he is a little more helpful, right? He is helpful to Lois in kind of giving her intel. Mm -hmm. I mean, Doomsday is tearing up the city at the end. It's like you didn't want to, you don't want to do help anything. Them. You want to step yeah. in and help help your three friends? Like you're just like, I'm good. I'm just gonna hang out over here. In the military tent, wherever I like, come on, it's a little tough. Yeah, a little tough to buy that. And so I think you know we'll see how they get there. But yeah, I think this is one where the the avenues are a little bit tricky. And and the quote to your point, the quote doesn't inspire confidence because it's like I think he actually says it's time I started fighting for him. Like, oh, yeah. okay, so you only needed however many million people to die before you. <laughs> you stepped up. The, 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 this, the, I mean, listen. He, to me, would be a super outsider. Like, even after they win, I would be treating him like, like, like crumbs. Like, get away from me, yo. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> get out of here. Because, <laughs> come on, man. Man of Steel, Doomsday, all these situations and, and no help whatsoever. It just doesn't, doesn't make any sense for me. Then there's some rumor of... If there were to be a sequel, that the storyline would have been Batman, Ben Affleck's uh, Bruce Wayne would have a relationship with Lois Lane, which was okay, but have a child together. And that he would later become the Batman. See, now this is creating a whole new thing, sort of. And it's to your point, Brian, you said it last week. This is a, 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 a this is a, an example of too many ideas. Yep, you got it. And I just don't see myself enjoying this storyline. I just don't see my. Is is? I mean, it, I'm trying. I'm 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 trying to refrain from going crazy here. I'm. I. I it's just. It's just none of the stuff that Zach has not. Zach Snyder has done with this. With this team. 
make sense in terms of story, in terms of who they are as heroes, who they've been as heroes. For me, what's worked for me and what has, from what I've seen from Marvel is bringing these storylines from the comic books to life with their slight adjustments, right? But it's sort of the same story. And I'm cool with that. You have a guy bringing these characters to life and doing and taking pieces of storylines, but not really fleshing them out. And again, uh, being and just having too many ideas, and it looks that way, and it comes off that way. I think it's also, you know, it fits with the same thesis. But if we played this through, it's like it's almost like taking the path of most resistance at the key moments in the series, right? So we started in Man of Steel, a highly controversial decision to have Superman kill Zod, and have this final fight be in city center. So these are already, you're, you've really made some big calls there in the initial movie. So you now have to deliver the consequences of those. And they tried in Batman versus Superman to some extent. I would say the damage part they tried to acknowledge with Batman kind of developing this dislike for Superman off that. Okay, you're on, you're on a path there. I don't think they ever really pay off the consequence of killing Zod and like what that does to Superman, you know, over time or what that does to Clark. So I think that's still unfinished. But then you move into the second one and we have this fulcrum moment of the Martha situation, which brings them in, in line, which is, of course, different than what we've seen in the comics. And again, the path of least resistance would have been, if you're going to involve Lex, probably something along the lines of Lex frames Superman in some way, Batman falls for it, then the world's greatest detective realizes, oh, I've been had, you know, and they kind of realign. Instead, you choose this very sort of emotional commonality with the mother. It's a little bit of a tough sell. Yeah. And then to then move into this, which is being reported. So let's play this out. So now we haven't seen Zach's version of this, but in the, so maybe this is all going to get cut. But in the theatrical version, there clearly is the beginnings of a flirtation between Batman and Wonder Woman, which is clearly true right from the comics. So if we assume that that's in this version somewhere, you would be unwinding that to have Batman fall for Lois while presumably while Superman is either dead or presumed dead. So that means that when Superman comes back and we see these scenes with him reconnecting with his humanity or his version of humanity with Lois, it would kind of be a lie because Lois has cheated on him sort of with Bruce. And then Bruce brings the team together, but now Superman's on a team with a guy who slept with his girl and had it like, so now you're moving forward. And the way the rumored storyline is, is like that it leads to Batman dying and sacrificing himself to the world. And that then catalyzes Clark to stay with Lois and raise the new Batman. It's too much, man. Like you're, yeah. you're asking us to buy into so yeah. much emotion yeah. and cross current and change at one time. Yeah. That's what I mean. Work. It just seems like there's so much easier ways to create stakes. Yeah. And this is asking us to stretch our imagination to where like, man, I read that and I was like, if Superman wanted to turn around and eradicate an entire city, I wouldn't have actually blame him. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I come back from the dead and this is what I find. <laughs> and then I gotta raise the new Batman. Come on, man. That's a that's a lot. That's a big ask right yeah. now. So I <laughs> no, I, I'd say that jokingly, but I just yeah, like yeah, yeah. You get my point is that it's just it's asking us to do too much, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. It, based off so much history that a lot of us have read and seen in animated films and shows, this is just so far out there that it's hard to really be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can believe it's just too much. It's just too much. So, what, two more weeks? Two uh, more yeah. weeks. March two more 18th. Weeks. Two more weeks. March 18th. We're almost there. Um, and yeah, we'll see. We'll see his vision. Um, and I guess 
Well, we, we've said this in the past, and I don't want to continue going over and over again what we've said, but, you know, how much better is, is this going to be? I doubt it's going to be that much better. Um, what do you be- read into the chapter titles, right? So that's the other thing I wanted to ask you. So the, the reference to all the king's horses, that's a Humpty Dumpty reference, or all the king's horses, all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. So that... That really Superman fly that Superman doesn't return until chapter five. That's sort of what I took from that, which is pretty late in the yeah. film. And then something darker is something we've heard Ben Affleck say in reference to Dark, dark side. side. Well, Dark Side, he doesn't know the name yet, but Dark Side. So that also implies we you know, as we suspected, Dark Side to the extent he's in this is really probably not in it till the final act. So structurally, the, the chapters didn't seem that surprising rising relative to the things we've heard i guess is sort of what's my takeaway i think the 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 parts i guess are there also to sort of watch each piece and and i see it all straight through sort of even though it possibly mm-hmm. i mean it only presents a few seconds of a scene a title sequence or whatever almost pulp fiction like oh um, interesting Hmm. But yeah, you're uh, right. Yeah, but to, I guess it's to see that and then to see that uh, that uh, part play out, right? I guess it, it. I guess it's easier to consume or to yeah. digest. So that's why that's there because it's four hours, man. I'm, yeah. It's hard to see a joint. Straight. Imagine Pulp Fiction would have been like that straight through. I don't think it. It would probably still be enjoyable, but not that much. But, yeah, I mean, the te- and the teasers have been good. I mean, I, you know, like I said, it's 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 kind of neat to see like the su- some of the new Superman scenes and him wor- walking through the ship, and we've seen scenes of that. So that stuff looks good. I mean, I'm I'm excited yeah. to see some of that stuff on on screen. But yeah, no, I when that that leak came out about the r- rumored storyline, I was like, wow, I, I I think we, I don't know, we'll see where this goes. I know I've been in the camp of that a sequel will happen, but that's what I was going to ask that, you that. I was going to ask you that before we move on. I was going to ask you, do you still? Because I'm going to ask you every week because more and more stuff is going to come out mm-hmm. do you still think we're going to get a sequel to this yeah i mean like i said i still on the camp of yes just because i feel like the numbers are going to justify it i do i will say though i do think there's one thing odd that's happening here that i i have no idea what's going on the the cast which has been until now very vocal and unilateral in support of zach has been a zero leading up to this and i don't know what's going on with that he is tweeting and instagramming a storm to promote this there hasn't been a single retweet not one of the cast even like ray fisher who publicly said he would promote it the only thing he's been tweeting has been more (laughs) shade at warner brothers so i mean cowell's been quiet gadot's been quiet momo like he's got and like some of them are actually out there promoting other projects right now. There's been nothing. And I that can't be a coincidence, but I can't put my finger on what that is and why they've been so absent from promoting this. Wasn't there a report that um, the studios didn't like, have seen it and didn't like it? I thought I, I thought I read something like that. But are they, would they be legally prevented from, from, retweeting the trailer or retweeting oh no i mean this is rumor this is rumors of them not liking the film behind the scenes there's rumor of them that they have seen it and oh the cast has seen it and doesn't like it not the cast the the movie studio well i wouldn't expect the studio to like it yeah wouldn't expect the studio to like his version if it was the greatest movie ever made to be quite honest but i just find the cast silence really odd given how supportive they were in getting this off the ground initially. Again, they're behind Zach for the purposes of getting his vision out there and what he intended to see no more. That's why the talk of seeing a Justice League 2, these people aren't coming back for another one, man. They're not. They're not. They are not. (laughs) All right. They are not. Let us know what you think about um, the Zack Snyder parts uh, that are going to be in the in the film, and I guess it, it makes sense for them to put it in there in order for us to digest it a little bit. Because watching a four-hour film straight through is a tough ask, but you know, we're, I guess the people who are there for Zack are going to watch it, you know. But I guess for those people who are just going to see it just to see what all the hype is about, 
um, this sort of makes sense. So let us know what you think in the comment section below. Uh, Chloe Zhao. Uh, Golden Globe Award winner, second female director to win Best Director. In and possibly an Oscar for her too, yeah. Yep. Yeah, it, it, it's congratulations to her. And she so happens to be directing The Eternals. And in an article, uh, actually in an interview, she has stated, and I'll leave all the links to the stuff that we're talking about in the description below. She states that Marvel took a huge, a huge chance because of if you think about how they shot their films and sound stages and stuff like that, and 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 she um, has been filming on location. One of her, one of her inspirations was The Revenant and watching how that was shot. And so this is going to possibly be a very different. Uh, film visually than what we've seen in terms of big action sequences um, and based on if you saw our, our previous show we said uh, I think we mentioned in the previous show that the the, the studio has seen it and, and they're high on, on, on the film my you know I don't think it's going to happen but you know we all know what happened with Ang Lee Everybody was high on him, Oscar winner for best director, whatever, with uh, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Then he does a Hulk, and the Hulk was this really thought-provoking film that nobody really got, and uh, it was a it was a huge disappointment. I doubt we get this. I, I doubt we get that with with, with this movie uh what are your thoughts on that article because you sent that to me and i was i started reading it right away yeah look i mean you you it's hard not to be excited when when you talk about in this day and age being able to shoot on location real sets uh you know re the thing about the i don't think the revenant is a great film personally but what she's referencing is lighting colors right they they were famous for, okay, we're gonna shoot at the same time every day to kind of build the scene. So it would take us 25 days to do one. That's the kind of stuff she's talking about. And Marvel has always been bright colors. You know, when, when you see the vibe, the CGI, it is almost always sort of, you know, it is rich color palette. This is kind of going a little bit the other way. This feels very natural, kind of feels more like great. She loves to, sh like, she loves to shoot it dawn dusk that's in her prior movies and she's mentioned she did a lot of that for this film so i think you're going to see some pretty wild versions and she even says the action is shot with that as a backdrop so i think she's on to something when she's if that's the case we are going to look at this movie and it's going to look very foreign from what we're used to in the mcu and again i i root for that i support that wholeheartedly so uh, I, I think you read this and you, and you see the buzz she's getting, you know, she's, I mean, she's blowing up. I mean, she's having a oh, yeah. moment is probably off to getting a lot of offers to do all sorts of genres. So Marvel, once again, I think early, you know, or on the front side of the curve with someone who's taking off in their mm -hmm. career. Yeah. I mean, I think this has the potential to be, you know, genre redefining if she's, if the hype's not misplaced. So, yeah, I am certainly very I'm, I'm scared about the excitement that I have for this film because I obviously don't want to just be disappointed but based on the, some of the things that I've read rumors that I've read about Madden's um, um, what's his name Madison right Robert Madison or oh, I forget oh, right. for Eternals yeah the lead oh, Richard Madden R Richard Madden yeah Icarus yeah I've heard that he was fantastic in this. So these are the rumors. These are rumors. The rumors about the movie studio is just loving what they've seen so far. Um, Chloe Zhao talking about, you know, they took a chance and they're, and, and, and they, they're doing something different. This is going to be different. Look what we got with WandaVision. That was completely different. And everybody was glued to their screens, waiting for everybody having pregame shows. Come on. Who does that for these shows? 
I mean, I, you I, you can say that you would do this for Game of Thrones when it was out, but I haven't heard this much excite, excitement for a show since 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 that. You know, and we're getting from WandaVision and then the hype around surrounding Eternals. And then and that's just even the that's just the movie. Then we talk about now we got to talk about the history of it all. This is again, this is a mm-hmm. precursor to possibly the mutants and how they come about. Right. So this is going to be a very a thought provoking film, visually stunning film. Action wise is going to be dope. There's a lot of things to look forward to for this movie. This will be one where the how Marvel manages the trailers is going to be critical because the minute they show you any of the visuals based upon what she's saying, you're going to immediately get a sense of how different the feel is. Like if you recall watching the Revenant trailer with Leo in the wilderness and the cold and seeing his breath, like you can see some of that on screen. This might be one where Marvel might be better served showing less. And I'll be curious because the characters aren't as established. So that gives you an incentive to show more. Yeah. I would encourage them to show less in yeah. the promotional material. Because it's Marvel. Because at, at, at the end of the day, it's Marvel. Everybody's going to see it. Everybody's going to go see it. And if the critical buzz is that high, they won't need to give away the, the big set pieces or the big kind of big action scenes or sort of the more wild manga style ideas that she keeps referencing. So yeah. I'd go less yeah. is more for this one. Yeah. Um, and this doesn't come out to November. We got a long way to go for this one. Let us know what you think of, uh, are you excited for Eternals? I'm pretty sure you are. Let us know in the comment section below. Uh, Marvel's best kept secret. It's supposed <laughs> to come out in May, right? July. July. We've seen trailers for Black Widow. We've seen some concept art for Eternals. We've seen from Shang Chi a leaked, what was it? A leaked toy. Like a Lego toy. (laughs) And there is um, uh, the lead actor in his costume. Or part of his costume, at least. I yeah, guess. part yeah. of it, because I was, I was like trying to see if I could see more. Yeah. <laughs> I was moving the screen. I'm like, no, this is all you're gonna get. And it's like, okay, this is coming out in July. I say for all those Marvel fans out there, which are in the millions, if in a month we don't get something. We hashtag the hell out of Shang Chi trailer. Something we gotta blast them. We gotta spam him to let them know that we need to see something because this is coming out in July, and we've seen absolutely nothing, pretty much. Brian, do you agree or disagree that they have to show us something at some point, at least soon? Well, if it if it's coming out in July. Yes. I think that's the biggest question with your idea. Is it coming out in July? You know, Black Widow in May. I think any day now we're going to have to get a final decision on what this is going to be. Because if they're going to go day and date, if they're going to go Disney Plus like Raya style, they need to promote that too. That's not a decision they can make on April 30th. So I think it all flows from that. I think it's basically they need to plant their flag on Black Widow one way or the other. And then once that happens, the rest of the schedule flows from there. And I think we start to see promotional material. Tricky, because with the pace of reopening and vaccination, and you're starting to see even like California, you know, New York, some of the key states for US theaters are coming off, you know, lockdowns, things like that. You know, there is a case to be made for one more delay. There's a case to be made to say, look, six more months out of all these properties and we're good. Um, so I don't know where, you know, what, what I know what we want, but if I was Bob Chapek, I don't know what the right path here is, but I think that's the bottleneck is like what to do with Black Widow. And once that happens, I agree. Look, we know the trailer's done because of the uh, Simulu told us it's done and he's seen it. So it's just sitting there. I mean, these movies, I think these movies were finished a year ago. It's not like they're in post-production now. They're done, fully done. They're just sitting there in the can. 
So the trailers are cut, everything's sitting there. That's why it's like, they just want finality on when they're gonna release these and how they're gonna structure them. And the minute that's done, they just put those graphics into the trailers and we're good. So I think it flows from Black Widow. And I think that decision has to come, I would guess in the next two weeks. Before we move on, there was uh, one of uh, <clears throat> our viewers said something very interesting to me. I want to hear your take on it. He said something to the effect that Shang-Chi will be the next sort of, how would I put it? Captain America type dude, the guy with that has these morals, but in a different way, he's going to be that that guy to, to I guess, inspire the, 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 the troops or whatever. He's going to be that next guy to take over that role. What do you think about that? Hey, that'd be awesome. I mean, that's consistent with at least some of the DNA of the character. I think he's actually referencing something that Jim Starlin said, who created Shang-Chi, who kind of put this idea out there. And, and Shang-Chi, I mean, he has those elements of oftentimes he acts as a secret agent of, kind, of, of, of a sort. Obviously, his knowledge of chi, right, his knowledge of sort of that that energy and sort of that inner peace and things like that lends itself to him being this force of balance within the team of heroes. So there's a lot there if you wanted to take, um, you know, Steve Rogers was probably, other than the serum, was probably a very grounded, real-world moral center for the team. So if you wanted a little bit more magical, mystical, but still moral center of the team, pretty good candidate for that yeah. and we don't know exactly how this series is going to connect and interact with the other series yet but i'm sure we'll find that out in the film so and i mean i'm curious because at least in the comics he basically is able to hand to hand defeat any of the heroes and hold his own even against gods yeah. so one would assume at some point he can command the respect of even sort of the more powerful beings um, yeah, yeah. so it would imply that he could actually fight captain marvel and not be embarrassed basically yeah yeah yeah, yeah 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 so we'll see but i, I think it'd be i think it'd be great i mean they clearly need new blood and they clearly need you know a new set of personalities to link with the old ones yeah and doc strange seems to be getting the iron man role like kind of that mentor role yeah so yeah someone does need to inherit that like who's who is the captain who's the who's the, the heart and soul of the team so yeah. maybe it'll be him Hopefully, listen, I'm asking everyone out there that if in a month, and that's a long time, in a month, if we don't get anything, start hashtagging Shang Chi trailer, spam, spam Marvel, do whatever you can to get them to say to them and have them understand that we need to see something because it's long overdue. Next up, you mentioned Bob Ch Chapek, uh, which is a good segue into, and he's indicating that we've reached possibly a point of no return when it comes to uh, movies and how movies are being released. You see Paramount um, uh, lessening the, the window between movie release and, and streaming. And I think there have been some others, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I mean, I think the industry as a whole, on average, has brought the, I don't know where, if we did it across every distributor where we are, but if it was 90 days when we started, I mean, we're probably somewhere between like 45 and 60 days, and some people are as low as 30, so I think that's where we're headed. Yeah, he says, he says um, he's not sure there's going back uh, to pre-pandemic theatrical windows. I mean, a lot of this has to do with the amount of content that's sitting and waiting to be released and waiting their turn mm -hmm. to be released. And the fact of the matter is that we've been seeing movies from home for the past six months a year, to a year. I'm used to it. Obviously there are films that I would like to see in, in the theaters, for example, Godzilla versus Khan. But if I don't get that opportunity Let's say things um, are too crazy in the, in the movie theaters, me meaning like I can't get a ticket or whatever. Everything is sold out. If two weeks pass by and I'm not able to get a ticket, I'm, am I going to wait another two weeks 
to see it streaming? Why not? I'm not going to wait three months. That's crazy, right? Mm -hmm. But think about all the films that are waiting to get a, uh, to be released. This is just uh, a situation where you have to adjust and everybody has to eat pretty much, right? So, um, and he says, I think the, cons the consumer is probably more impatient than they've ever been before. Yeah. <laughs> We're not getting it. I think when this started, we weren't seeing any films, right? We were just seeing whatever Netflix had or whatever these other streaming services have. And then they started releasing films to the streaming platforms and people are getting used to it. What do you think, Brian? Is is he onto something with this? Yeah, no, I think we've crossed the Rubicon when it comes to how movies are released and, and distributed. I don't think we're ever going back. I mean, I was... It's funny, you go back to like the 1980s and you look at movies like E.T., Back to the Future. I think Back to the Future was the number one movie in America like nine or 10 weeks in a row. Wow. I mean, it's never going to happen again, ever. But you look at it from the standpoint of the theaters, right? We feel like the theaters have been getting the, the short end of the stick. You know, if I spin it the other way, shorter windows create urgency. If the product is something that the big screen adds to. So if you had a movie where you said, okay, I've only got 30 days, really. It's only got 30 days in the theater before it kind of like, that's, that's the window that I've got to see this before. Like there are certain movies where you're going to be like, I can't wait. Like, I've got to get there in those yeah. 30 days. So for a theater, you might actually get some bigger opening weekends and second weekends because of the fact that there is this greater urgency for the right kind of movie to go to the theater. And then behind that, because you have a greater churn, you'll be bringing a new movie in. So when you think about the next movie, think about the opening weekend of the next movie versus the third weekend of the prior movie. For these types of films, the opening weekends are always gonna make bigger box if they're decent. Yeah. So for a theater, I'd rather have higher turnover, but more premieres, more opening weekends, more events over the course of the year. Yeah. That probably is more profitable for me than, hey, I gotta have Endgame in the theater for three months or four mm -hmm. months. Like as good as it is, like by month three, you know, you, you might have it on two screens. It's not really making a lot for you during the day. Mm -hmm. So yeah. so there's something for everyone in this, but I think I think Chapek's right. Like. The, the prevalence of streaming also just says, look, if the movie isn't up to that standard, you and I are not going to the theater to see it. We'll be very content to save some concessions money, save the four tickets we would have to buy and just pay 30 bucks or whatever it's gonna be for one viewing on our streaming service. And I think that's right. So it's like, yeah. it's it makes it a meritocracy. You gotta yeah. earn our money. Yeah. Like it's, yeah. And I don't think that's a bad thing in terms of product quality and budgeting. So, you know, I think he's right. And I think that's where we're headed, but it's interesting. I don't think we've quite hit on the final solution for this yet. I think we're still in the experimental phase. And I think he acknowledges it in the article. He talks about data points, you know, yeah. Raya has not been amazing at the box office to start. The box office there has been for a great reviewed film, like an amazing reviewed film, a family film, Box office has been actually was like half of what Tom and Jerry did. Or, you know, we, we talk about Warner's and HBO Max and we talk about Tom and Jerry did some nice numbers at the box <laughs> office, did twice what Riot did. So I don't think we figured out quite what the right balance and mix is for these products yet. But every time we put one out there, Disney's learning and these companies are learning like where the right channel is. So, you know, give us a couple of years. I think you'll have a formula that everyone kind of conforms to mm. and that leaves a path for you know, basically the movies and the theaters to exist on the merits of what's going in there. Uh, and to your point, the schedule is going to be just cheap and packed. Yeah, man. For a couple of years, at least. Yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, let us know in the comment section below what do you think. Uh, are you going to wait to go see a movie that's been out in the theaters three, week, three weeks and it's supposed to come out of the theaters in a week or two weeks after that? Might as well just stay home and watch it, right? Um, let us know in the comment section what you think about that whole uh, scenario and how that you think is going to work. And will you be at home just watching a lot of films? 
if you don't care to go to the movie theaters. I, I mean, I don't really care too much to go to the movie theaters. There's some films, I'll, I'll try to always go to the movie theaters if I can. But if it makes it impossible for the first two weeks that I that I want to see this film, because, you know, right now you can just on your phone buy four tickets. It can things can sell out very quickly as soon as they come, as soon as they make an announcement, tickets are on sale. If you're not privy to that information immediately, you're out of luck part pretty much, right? So before we end the show, I just wanted to uh, touch on this subject real quick. I wanted to find out your, your, your thoughts on this. I read some articles, um, but I, I saw the word fatigue with superhero films and stuff like that. We have um, in May, I believe it's in May, May 7th, I believe, we have this uh, uh, on Netflix, uh, Jupiter's Legacy coming out. Mm -hmm. Which I showed you. You hadn't you hadn't heard about it tonight. No, it was like right? story. It's like a storyboard art trailer. Yeah. Yeah. We got Invincible. We got other things that are coming out. Uh, Umbrella Academy has been a, a major hit. I've always talked about fatigue setting in at some point. Do you? It, it doesn't seem that there is a sort of uh, that there is a fatigue going to be setting in anytime soon would you agree with that yeah no I, I think people i think part of the people the flaw in that thinking is that people think superhero genre is only one thing i think that's that's the flaw premise to me it's like what what the boys what umbrella academy what invincible maybe what this this new net this um, new netflix series even things like we hear like what eternals could be yeah th these are technically all superhero comic book genre but there's subgenres to that and i think you're seeing these shows find niches and avenues and originality that makes them new it's people don't i don't think people approach these with the stigma of oh there's a comic book behind this oh it's gonna be it's, it's mm -hmm. not all the same I mean, yeah. like, you know deadpool's very different than man of steel like yeah they're technically both comic book movies but they're written and presented very differently. So, and I think we're seeing, you know, we've seen like Captain America Winter Soldier is a comic book movie, but it's presented as a, it has a genre onto itself, which is, it is based on the political thriller. And so I think you're gonna see more of that. These like, oh, it's a comic book, it's a comic book movie, but it's more of like a spy movie. It's a comic book movie, but it's more of a horror movie, more of a thriller. And so, and that's, or it's more of a Western, like yeah. they're all gonna go those different, like the Mandalorian is a Western, but it's Star yeah. Wars. So, yeah. so, but it, you know, so I think that's what people miss in their assessment is they just put one blanket on the genre and say people are going to get tired of it. It's like, oh, people are going to get tired if it's bad, if it's yeah. retread, right? The reason why we crit we don't criticize, but the reason why we continue to push Marvel to go to new areas is because the same formula that worked so well for the first 22 movies is probably not going to work as well on movie 220. Yeah. And they know that. So you yeah. have to find new formulas. And I think... That's, what, that's why we love when we see these things that are like, oh, they hit on something different. It just happens to have a cape or a superpower or something out of the comics that we are connected to in another way. So no, I don't think it's at all fatigue at all, as long as it just pushes filmmakers and studios to make sure that what they green light is good. Because look, I mean, part of the reason that we have this controversy around what happened with Justice League is like, look, the audience is already discriminating. If the audience wasn't discriminating, Justice League would have done two billion. Yeah, yeah. Because that's yeah, yeah. brand name characters out of comic. But people realized this production was troubled and the output was not good. Yeah. So the word of mouth was bad, critical acclaim was bad, and people didn't go see it. Yeah. I mean, and so people are already making that distinction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and good good product will always find a big audience. Doesn't matter if it's true, 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 yeah. true. I just for some for sometimes I just think like we get this. Uh, these new shows coming out or whatever. Like there's a bunch and I, I I don't know the names of them, but I see them like you think there's regular shows or oh, but this kid has his po this power. And it's like it's being used a lot in in, in new in new uh shows. Uh so that what is what gets me uh scared to the point where people are just not gonna want to uh watch another superhero film. 
I mean, obviously it all depends, right? Um, but I will say there's a I will say there's an element of nostalgia which connects to our prior topic about theaters. There's a piece of this experience that's not coming back that I miss, which was back in the day when you couldn't reserve your seat and you had to go line up that opening day and you'd wait for one, two, three hours. <laughs> but you'd wait in line with other people who were just as passionate about yeah. what you were about to see. And you yeah. would meet these people and just talk. Oh, yeah. Random people. Like, I remember watching. So my favorite one was Dark Knight in 08. I remember watching it. In Link it was the Lincoln Center IMAX. And we're just, you know, there with a couple of my friends and I'm, but we're talking to the people next to us about Batman and about DC comics and people are dressed up and it's like, what are they excited about? Um, and it's like, those days are gone, right? So yeah. now we, you know, if we go to the theater, we reserve our seats. And, and I remember that one was actually super special random story because we were all lined up there and I, we were up near the front and they're letting out the prior show and Chris Nolan and Steven Spielberg walk out of the oh, prior show wow. together. And people gave them a standing ovation wow. as they're like walking in front of everyone. Now, and I was like, you know, you'll never get that moment again as a, as a fan of this. So I will miss that. But I can't wait to go back to the theater for the right oh, yeah. project when it's yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, let us know in the comment section below about um, how do you feel about uh, people talking about fatigue. And, and to Brian's point, if the product is good, people are going to come out and see something different. If it's the same thing over and over again, obviously you're going to probably start feeling a little bit of that, 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 that fatigue uh, feeling. So, um, but that's our show for today. Uh, we covered a lot. This was a great show. Uh, Brian, any last words? No, like you said, we're two weeks away from Snyder cut and Falcon and Winter Soldier. And as I said, we've told people we got the Snyder Cut Oscars coming and it's going to be fun and different. Like I said, we already hinted, you know, this, our thoughts on Ray Fisher, but it, you know, some of it's going to be fun. Some of it's going to be, you know, very serious. I think we're looking for highs and lows, but you know, two weeks from now is going to be just an amazing, amazing weekend, I think. So really looking forward to that. Yep. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to that too. Uh, that's our show for today. Please let us, uh, uh, hit that cop sorry hit that um like button hit that subscription button that, that subscription button button hit that notification bell um share it with your friends um and we thank you for uh joining us once again and we'll see you next week on the agenda report